Okay, now we're going to begin our discussion specifically on ecological populations. And as is the case in this text with the different chapters, they start the discussion with uh, particular case studies that look at the topic at hand. And here we look at um, kelp forests. And kelp forests are these underwater forests, you might say, that you find in certain coastal areas, particularly where you have cooler water. So the Pacific Northwest, uh, along Alaska, parts of the northern Pacific off of uh, Asia, Japan, that is areas you have these kelp forests. You don't find them on the Gulf Coast because the water is too warm and kelp doesn't grow there. These kelp forests are, are very important habitats for many different species, um, but the population of kelp is, is strongly impacted by, as I said, the uh, non-living conditions such as water temperature, for example, but also um, other species, other populations present. Um, in particular, so there are some areas where you find more and less kelp, and even in the area where it appears that, that the habitat is suitable for kelp, sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't. Um, and what studies have shown is that um, sea urchins, um, these creatures, these spiny creatures that live at the bottom of, of shallow areas of the ocean, um, there's a strong relationship, correlation, if you will, between um, the number of urchins and the status of the kelp forest. And that is, when you have lots of urchins present, you tend to have very little kelp. And why is that? It's because urchins basically eat the kelp. Um, and as you can see in some experiments where they did some removals of the urchins, you can see that the kelp um, populations come back or diversify, grow quite a bit. Um, and so this is an example again of sort of species interactions. We said how in the first chapter, no species is an island, there's always interactions occurring. And so we can see here one particular species impacting the population of another species. Um, and so when we talk about populations, um, there are many terms and ways we can think about them. Of course, you can think of basically the distribution, and as you can imagine, that's basically where they are. Where do you find them on the globe, on a particular country, particular state, whatever the case might be. Um, and then related to that, you have the abundance. So of course, where are they? And what are the numbers? Um, is this a type of species that has very populations that have very high numbers of individuals or relatively few individuals? It can, it can vary a great deal between and within species. And so when we look at any given population, again, related to abundance, we can talk about the size of that population, again, the number of individuals in that population. And related to that, we can think about density. And of course, density is the number per unit area. And as you can imagine, some species have very dense populations, lots of individuals in a given area, and some have very diffuse, less dense populations. Um, it might not surprise you to think of a particular insect species you know, as having very densely populated areas, whereas something like tigers are not very dense. They are spread out across the landscape, and in a given area, there's not that many of them. Um, and so here we see um, some studies that look at this particular type of insect that likes to hang out on goldenrods. And we can see there's various populations that have been studied. They're looking at particular three. There's three of Montezuma, Maple Island, and this one called Hector. And so you can see that some of the populations are larger than the others. The Hector is, for example, there's greater density and numbers of these individuals than the other populations. But of course, we can see over time the size of the population varies a great deal as well. You can see Montezuma is never very large or densely populated in terms of the species. Maple Island it has this growth here at the end here. Hector, there's some all the time, but you can see it kind of goes up and down. And some years there's lots of them, and some years there's not very many. And you can imagine come up with many hypotheses perhaps as to why there's variation between one year and the next. Um, across the landscape, um, 
species, their populations are not typically uniformly distributed, and that is there's a patchy nature to those populations. And of course, what can be causing that? Well, the population, that particular species might have very specific requirements for where it can live, and so that require that that almost necessitates that it's going to be patchy because you don't find those requirements everywhere um, across the landscape. And but again, that's not sometimes you do find species that you know can live in a wide variety of habitats. So the the how patchy that particular species is. Um, can depend on that species requirements. Um, here's one, an example where they talk about these heaths. These are these um, uh, uh, treeless habitats that you find in southern England. And um, so the light tan area is sort of the historical distribution of these areas. And uh, the orange reddish color is the more recent distribution. You can see that it's become more patchy. Now, this. So clearly, at one point, the heath, these heath species of plants were living throughout this area, but now they're just restricted to these little islands almost. Is that because that habitat has changed otherwise and can't, now it, they can't grow here because the conditions are different? Um, well, of course, between 1759 and 1978, there has, of course, also been a significant change in the size of the human population, human habitations, and so one probably hypothesis about why this is happening has to do with the alteration of the habitat by people and more people living in there, more cities and towns and things like that, perhaps promoting this patchy distribution. Now, we have to talk uh, here also about the nature of the individual, which might seem self-evident. Obviously, with us, we know what individuals are, individual people. But it's not that way with all species. Um, for example, you look at these aspen trees here, and of course you see these different trees, and you think that they're individual trees. But um, when you look underground, uh, you basically see there's a connection between these trees, and that they are, in fact, all genetically the same. That is, they are an individual genet. If you have a group of individuals that share the same genome, they are referred to as a genet. And so they're essentially the result in terms of reproduction of a single fertilization event, but has spread to multiple trees by um, what we would essentially asexual reproduction. Um, it's equivalent to what grass do. I don't know if you ever, if you ever dig up grass, if you ever had to remove it out of a garden or something, you can see that they're connected under the ground. The roots and there are these basically these underground stems that connect them. And these aspen trees are a little interesting in terms of tree species that they share the same kind of growth form. You don't see this kind of thing with oaks and hickories. When you see two different oak trees, you pretty much assume they're separate individuals. But here, they're all a single genet. But you can have a situation where um, the genet can separate into separate individuals, and that's what we call a ramet. And the classic example that's given in your text is with strawberries. So what can happen is you can start with a single strawberry plant, and it sends out this horizontal stem, okay, and it can form separate individual, or it can reproduce asexually. So all five of those individuals are a single genet, they're all the same genetically, but ultimately the connections between them can be severed if, such that now they are separate individuals, and so that case we then refer to them as a ramhead. They, they share the same genome, but now they have become separate individuals. There's no connection between them. Um, and you can see we're kind of focusing on plants. Now, there are some situations in the animal kingdom where this happens because there are certain types of reptiles, these things known as whiptail lizards, that reproduce asexually and so can result in genets. Hydra as well, individuals can bud off. Corals grow in these clusters that can be all the same genet. 
But again, once those individuals become separated from each other, we refer to them as ramets because they have separate physiology now. Um, of course, the distribution of species is influenced by the suitability of habitat. They can have specific requirements, as we said when we were talking about the patchy nature of species distributions. Um, here's an example from the southwest U.S. where some abiotic factors in particular influence this. So we have the creosote bush, and its distribution is shown by the reddish outline. Then you have the saguaro cactus, which is the brown. Uh, you can see the saguaro, it's somewhat patchy distribution, particularly down there in Mexico. But you'll perhaps notice there's this dotted line here, and that dotted line denotes um, above that line, it's essentially colder for longer periods of time, and below that line, it doesn't stay as cold for very long. And so you can see in this situation, temperature in particular influences the distribution of the saguaro cactus more so than the creosote bush. It can tolerate a wider range of temperatures than, than the cactus. Um, of course, biotic factors can influence uh, distribution of number of individuals in a population. Here's an example. This is the Apuntia cactus, this prickly, prickly pear cactus, and this is in Australia. It's non-native to Australia. It was introduced there, and it kind of went crazy. And, was growing everywhere and be could become a pest, sort of like kudzu here in the southeast United States. Well, the Australians are trying to figure out what to do with this, so they went to where the Apuntia pear cactus is native, which is basically in the Americas and uh, Central America and southern parts of North America, and they found a moth that lays its eggs on the cactus, and then the larvae of the moth basically feed on the cactus. And in this case, it did a beautiful job of eliminating the cactus, not completely. The cactus is still there, but now its population is much smaller because there's this moth that feeds on it. In this experimental plot here, you can see the cactus has been decimated by the moth. Um, interactions, um, both biotic and abiotic, can influence where you find particular populations. Uh, here's this uh, barnacle that lives in the coastal areas, again, in cold areas, much like the kelp. And um, this species is influenced by both temperature. It likes colder waters. So it will be found, again, in the North Pacific here. But it's also impacted by the presence of other species. So its range which would cover this whole area based on temperature of the water, is actually somewhat restricted because further south here, there is competition from another species that keeps it from spreading to that area. So in this case, both temperature and other species impact where you find this particular barnacle. Disturbance is an important factor as well. Um, in the community ecology section, we'll talk about um, the process of succession, which are the changes that occur through time, whoops, that's just through time, in natural systems. So a field will start out as containing mostly grasses and herbaceous plants, then you'll have shrubs come in, and then you'll have the bigger trees, et cetera, et cetera. This, of course, takes many centuries for this process to happen. But there are certain species, for example, that are only found in the early stages of this successional process. And so something like disturbance can be very important in maintaining these species that are found earlier in the succession of the habitat. Um, and so things like forest fires as long as they don't eliminate the whole forest, but just little parts of it, can actually promote diversity by keeping parts of the landscape in an earlier stage of succession. History and dispersal limits. Um, so we only find polar bears in the Arctic. Presumably, they could probably survive just as well in the Antarctic, but they're not there because they've never dispersed there, and they've got this big old planet they've got in the way in the equator, and it's too hot there, and they can't get there, so that can limit them. Here's an experiment where this one plant, Impatience capensis, was only found in these two little patches, but 
it was experimentally distributed, the seeds were to other areas and it was able to expand. And so it was limited otherwise.